always enjoy our breakfast together in the, the good fellowship. God is good. Get my uh, stuff going here. Well, Father, we thank you for bringing us together today. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your love and your kindness. And, and we ask, Lord, that you would help us simply to, to hear your voice and to draw near to you, Lord. And help us to be the men that you want us to be, truly men after your own heart. And so guide us, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, would you guys stand with me? We're going to sing a couple of short little choruses and uh, get into it. But uh, the first one is one of, my, one of the very first worship songs I ever learned uh, based on Psalm 5. And I just love it because it's based on Scripture. But give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry. My King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. One more time. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray, my voice shalt thou hear in the morning. O Lord, in the morning will I direct my prayer. Unto thee and will look up. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, all the days of my life to behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple, the temple of the Lord, to behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple the temple of the Lord. <laughs> Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me 
the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Gracious Father, we're grateful to be here today. We're grateful, Lord, to, to gather together, Lord, and just to sing your praises and to, to commune with you. And Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts today, that you would strengthen us as men, Lord, to serve you and to please you, and that truly we would be men after your own heart. Have your way in us this morning, Father. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Well, welcome you guys. You can be seated. <clears throat> this morning, we're going to be in uh, Psalm 19. And um, I went to a, a, a conference a few weeks ago, and uh, one of the speakers, Don McClure, uh, was kind of just going over Psalm 19, and it's it's actually one of my favorite psalms. It's a, a, a favorite portion of Scripture for me, and I've studied it through many times. But you know how it is when you've, you, you, you know, the, the pastor says, open up to Psalm 19 or Psalm whatever, and you go, all right, man, I know that one pretty good. And so you kind of sit back, and you're just like, okay, you know. And, and I was just kind of really ministered to, uh, as, as uh, Don McClure shared a few, uh, you know, things with me that I hadn't heard before or perceived before. And I just uh, was excited about it, and I wanted to actually kind of turn it around and share it with you guys, because uh, for me it was, uh, uh, again, pretty cool. But uh, if your Bible's open to Psalm 19, uh, let's stand together for just for a second. We'll read it together, then we'll go back and we'll, uh, we'll study it through. But uh, Psalm 19, beginning at verse 1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Uh, day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Uh, their line has gone out through all the earth and all their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, uh, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep me back, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Uh, let me not, let them not have dominion over me, Lord, then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Gracious Father, once again, uh, we look to you uh, for your wisdom, for your instruction, Lord, in this passage and in general. And so would you speak to us this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You guys can be seated. <clears throat> well, as you read over the psalm, um, you think about David being a, probably a, a young man or a, a maybe considered a boy uh, out, you know, in the fields. Uh, he's tending the sheep. Uh, he's camping out there quite a bit. Uh, a lot of times, you know, even though we had a big family and they had a home and stuff, uh, he'd be out for days at a time and come back. And uh, I've never tended sheep. You know, I've never you know, been a 
you know, a husbandman, like of cattle, that kind of stuff. But I can just imagine kind of being out there and everything's kind of contained. The sheep are doing okay. And then you're just kind of kicking back under a shade tree or something like that. Or maybe it's getting to be dusk and nighttime. And, uh, and even though, you know, you probably ought to be asleep at some point, you just wake up and you're looking up and you see the stars and everything. And then David, you know, writes this psalm about the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. And in that first part there, you know, when it says it shows forth his handiwork, uh, I don't know why, I just kind of go back to my, uh, my police days a little bit, that it's uh, his fingerprints are on it. You know, that there's evidence of God, if you will, that he's been there, that he's interacted, that he's done something. And, um, and the heavens and the universe declare that, that constant, unending hugeness of God, the power and the faithfulness and the kindness of God, and really the capacity of God to, to make something so cool, so big, so beautiful that we could enjoy it. Uh, we read in Psalm 8, verses, uh, verse 3 and 4, it says, When I consider your heavens the work of your fingers, uh, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? You know, and the, the grandness and the expanse of space and, and the heavens and all those things and how big that is. And then you think for just a moment, you know, the God that created all those things and the power that it took and uh, the wisdom and all those things that went into it. And yet God is mindful of us. It's humbling when you think about God, you know, caring what we go through, caring about our lives and providing for us and all the different things that he does. And so the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows forth his handiwork, then day into day utter speech and night into night reveals knowledge. And so often, you know, we think that we see clearly in the daytime. You know, that's when you can work, that's when you can do stuff. And um, we get a lot of information during the daytime, but it's interesting how oftentimes, and this happens to me many times, uh, I'll go to bed, I'll go to sleep, and I'll wake up, you know, sometimes two or three in the morning, and I'm thinking about a project. And all of a sudden, in my mind, I I'm not there physically with my tools on stuff, but in my mind, I've, I've cut the piece of wood, I've done the thing, and I, I've assembled it, and, and God's given me actual understanding, almost like in a dream, you know, and, and the, the nighttime brings that, that understanding of things. But uh, one of the things that was brought out at this conference is that, um, you know, we see more at night, and we learn more in the nighttime of our lives. It's the dark times, it's the, the hard times, it's the crisis, the things that we go through, the, the trials that we go through at times that seem to teach us the most about who we are in our relationship with God. And, you know, I know that for me, I look back over my spiritual walk with the Lord, and it was the hard times, it was the, 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 the difficult things that I went through where I seemed to grow the most, where I seemed to get stronger, uh, where the Lord does that work in me. And, uh, and it's not always the easy times, uh, but uh, in those dark times, and like at night unto night reveals knowledge. And then in verse 3, there's no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. Uh, their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words uh, to the end of the world. And, um, you know, the, their line has gone out. I think about the, uh, a plumb line or a measuring line or a measuring tape, whatever that standard is. And uh, as, I, as I look at this, uh, especially as you get later on when it starts talking about the, the law and the testimony and the statutes and stuff. Uh, but their line is the, um, the, the measuring line or the, um, the standard, if you will. And what I've discovered in my life, and I pray that you have in yours as well, is that God's word is that measuring line. God's word is that standard, you know, that we gauge everything by that. And that's how we measure things. That's how we understand where we are and who we are and all those kinds of things. And so, you know, their line has gone out through all the earth and the words to the end of the world. But as you put all this together, as David is kind of laying this out, you know, um, today when we want to navigate, I mean, I've got a, uh, a GPS thing on my, my truck. You know, it's got a little map that I follow around at times because I don't always know where I'm going. And, uh, or if I, you know, old school, I've got a, a, a whole a little box in my center console that's got all these maps. I ought to get rid of them. I haven't touched them in years. But, uh, you know, a map of the city of Susanville, a map of Portland, a map of, you know, L.A. and all that kind of stuff. And you look at these, these, these maps, you know, a cartographer at one point sat down and drew them all out. And so we look at that. And, uh, and now with satellite technology, and they're up there taking pictures, and then that's how we navigate. But there was a time uh, in, uh, in history anyway where people navigated by the stars. Uh, when I was in Israel, 
uh, a couple times. I had the same tour guide uh, three or four times. And his name is Arie, and uh, his specialty uh, when he was in, actually active in the uh, IDF was that he was the guy they counted on to lead patrols at night because he didn't need a compass, he didn't need GPS or a map. He knew the stars, and he literally navigated all over the place in the dark in Israel based on the stars. And, uh, and I remember from, you know, mostly from movies and stuff, but these old Navy or, or, or seafaring movies where the guy would get out a sextant. You know where the sextant is? It kind of measures the horizon and the angle to certain stars or the sun and different things. And you could use this if you knew where the stars were up above you and you'd measure where they're at, you could actually kind of pinpoint where you were. Today, most people navigate through life looking down, looking down at the map, looking down at the world, looking down at stuff. But if we really want to know how to get to where we want to go, we've got to look up. If you want clear direction, we need to look up. One of the things that was pointed out uh, at one point to me was that the heavens pretty much stay the same. I mean, you look up, and there's the, the, the star patterns, and I'm not an astronomer by any stretch. I mean, I can figure out what the Milky Way is, and that's just about it. Uh, you know, I wish I knew more about astronomy. But uh, the heavens stay the same. But when you look down, the earth changes. And things are changing down here all the time. But I think about even Noah's flood. I mean, it started off looking one way. Then after the flood, God pretty much rearranged the whole thing, and the topography completely changed. You know, I read my Bible about, like, the Garden of Eden, and you start to think, oh, and you use some of the same names, the River Euphrates and the River this and River that. And you go, oh, man, maybe, you know. And, but we don't know where the Garden of Eden was, really, They've, even though we've got some of the same names. But things have changed quite a bit down here. But when you look up, it's the same. And to me, it reflects even the face of our God, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if you want real direction or clear direction in life, then I think we need to keep uh, looking up. And, uh, you know, when you use uh, the Bible, God's word, uh, like that line that's gone out through all the earth, he'll give us that direction that we need. I think about Psalm 119, verse 105, that says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know, I think about uh, uh, Proverbs 3, 5, 6, and 7, that says, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. He'll give us that, that clear direction. And so we need to keep looking up more than we need uh, to be looking down. But then he describes it. He says, verse 5, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. It's rising it's from one end of heaven and circuit to the other end, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. Then we get to verses 7 uh, through 11, which is like one of my favorite portions of this uh, this passage. And, and um I've always enjoyed looking at uh, the different facets here. The, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, and the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And I, as I've studied through this on my own, I've always enjoyed the, uh, the, the different ways of describing God's word, you know, the law, the testimony, the statutes, the commandments, and the fear of the Lord and his judgments. And I don't know if you've seen it. I have, you know, uh, like, like I have, but uh, I like the cause and effect aspect of this. There's the law, and then it's described as being perfect, and then the result is uh, converting the soul. There's something about the law that converts the soul. And, um, and I think about what the law is. I mean, I, I think about the first five books of the Bible, the, the Pentateuch, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so that's the law. Then it moves on later on to the history books and the prophets and stuff. But there's something about the law. And, uh, and if, if I just take that word law and just think of it as being God's word is perfect, but it leads to conversion. And I think about what we read, and you've heard it so many times, I'm sure, from Romans chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's that, there's that miraculous power of God's word to transform a man's heart, to change a man's heart, and to bring him to a place, as it says here, the converting of the soul and uh, the power of God's word. In uh, Hebrews 4.12, it says, the, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. But the literally just the power of God's word to change a man's heart. I've seen men that were you know, beaten 
uh, severely trying to force them to do something, and their body might be broken, but their mind's going to go, no, I won't do it. You know, stubborn creatures. You know, I've seen people that have been coerced and all kinds of stuff, and, uh, and then at the last moment, they go, no, I won't do it. You know, because there's a, there's a, 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 I don't know if it's a strength in human character or a weakness in human character, but there's just that something that you can't always just force an individual to think differently, to, to be differently or whatever. You can compel them physically, but you can't change what's in here or what's in their heart. But God's word seems to do that on a pretty consistent basis, <laughs> how God's word changes us. And, you know, we can, we can argue with people at times about stuff. And, you know, you dig in your heels, whatever, and all of a sudden you read a scripture and you go, oh, <laughs> you know, and I, I did that, that happened to me just a couple of days ago. I was reading through some stuff, some things that I believe for quite a while, and then I was presented with a scripture and went, oh, <laughs> you know, and my whole paradigm had to change because I had to decide that moment, am I going to stick with what I think and my opinion about something, or am I going to stick with God's word? And, you know, it's kind of a, a given that God's word is going to reign supreme, but that aspect of the law of converting the soul. Well, I've always seen this as you go through. The next thing is the testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. And I think about the testimonies. What is that? I know it's another description of God's word in a way, but it's also specific. Think about the testimonies that you read about in the Bible. I mean, the, the first one I can recall offhand uh, was the testimony of Abram. You know, as God called him out of the era of the Chaldees, uh, you know, he, he goes, he leaves his place where he's comfortable with his family he goes out as God leads him, and then God pr proves himself faithful along the entire journey. Eventually, he surrenders to God, or, you know, he believes God. God accounts it to, right, to him as righteousness, and then uh, he changes his name from Abram to Abraham. And then he continues in his trek, you know, and, and as he grows. And I think about Joshua and so many of the other characters uh, that we read about in the Bible and the testimonies of their lives. I think about Samuel, you know, being consecrated to the Lord as a child. And, and, and being really kind of pretty ignorant of God in a certain sense. And when God was calling him to him and, you know, waking him up in the middle of the night, he kept running back to Eli. Yes, sir. What, you know, what do you want? And he goes, hey, next time you hear that, say, Lord, speak, your servant is listening. And that began Samuel's dialogue with God to the point where none of Samuel's words fell to the ground. And that Samuel was the man that brought the word of God back to the nation of God. And I just, I just love reading about his life and the testimony of his life. And so there's all these testimonies that are contained in God's word, and, it, and they're described here as being sure, but as you, as you take heed to these things and learn the lessons that they're learning, then it says that it'll make us wise, it makes the simple wise. I say that we're the simple, okay? Uh, I, I just kind of presume that, that we're the simple ones, and, but he'll give us the wisdom, you know, that he wants us to have. And then when you get to the statutes, uh, verse 8, uh, again, another uh, description of God's word, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart and um and when he says the statue of the lord are right it's almost like saying they're righteous you know they're perfect there's nothing wrong with them and um and so you you, you begin to discern well, what are the statutes of the lord and, and to me that's some of the do's and the don'ts god says do certain things he said don't do certain things and, and when you abide by that as you as you see that as you're going through it's like okay i want to be pleasing to god you know, and, and there's a few verses in the Bible that say, and this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Well, those are the things you want to focus on and do. But those statutes that, the, that are recorded for us that are, are right, rejoicing the heart, then the commandment of the Lord. I mean, there's some things he tells you flat out, do this or don't do that. You know, and, uh, and there are those gray areas at times. There's those things where we have the ability to discern or, or, or degree of liberty. But then when you get down to the commandments, and again, this is just another, you know, description of God's word. But there are parts of God's word that are, there's no wiggle room. You know, there isn't a, a, a place in, as an example for liberty in that subject or the other because God's commanded us certain things, but the commandments of the Lord are pure. They're holy, enlightening the eyes. And then the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And so you, you, you think about these things. And as I, like I said, I see the cause and effect between what's described as God's word, like the law or the testimony, and then there's a description of it, like, you know, it's, it's perfect, or it's sure, or it's right, um, or it's pure. But then there's the effect every single time. And so I've, that's the thing I've focused on over the years. But what the Lord showed me while I was at this conference with, is that there's a progression here that I had not recognized before. And it blessed me when I finally recognized it. When it says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, 
there is that impact of God's word that leads us to salvation. There's that aspect of, you know, our soul is converted. It changes from what it was to what it now is, you know, and, uh, and, and God gives us this, this ability at this point that we get, we get saved, we're converted. But then the testimony is you, is you continue. Now you start off in the law of the Lord, which is perfect, and you end up getting saved, getting converted. But as you continue to walk with him, you get to the testimony. You begin to read your Bible and understand what's going on in the lives of the people that are described in the Bible. And, and the testimony of the Lord is sure, but now it makes us wise. We go from being converted and we, we advance, if you will, or progress in our walk. And now we start to understand things. We have actually wisdom. And I think about in Proverbs chapter 1 where it says that the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Then you get to Proverbs chapter 9 and it says, well, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding or wisdom. So there's a progression there as you, as you move on. And here you go from conversion now that you're moving on to wisdom. But if you continue in God's word to the statutes of the Lord, which are right, then it says that it rejoices the heart. And so you go from salvation to wisdom to rejoicing because all of a sudden you realize what you've got in your hand. I mean, have you ever been there where you've had something and you didn't realize the value of it? Then one day your eyes were opened up and you realize, wow, I've got something really valuable here. And, and you realize as you go from being saved, you have that initial dose of wisdom or understanding. And then now you're rejoicing uh, in your heart because you realize, I don't deserve this. <laughs> I deserve to, I, I deserve punishment. I deserve death and destruction. But by the grace of God, you know, I am saved. And you begin to rejoice just in that. But as you're in that place of getting saved and, and, and becoming wiser in the word and rejoicing because you're recognizing what's, what you have in your hands, then you, you advance still, you continue in God's word to the commandment, which is pure, and it opens your eyes. And all of a sudden, your eyes are open to things that they never were before. But what I'm trying to kind of point out here is there's this progression in our spiritual walk and hopefully in our maturity in the Lord that we go from simple salvation, if you will, to wisdom, to rejoicing, and now our eyes are open to all kinds of stuff. And it's amazing when you've got the Holy Spirit living in you and the discernment that he gives us that all of a sudden we understand what's going on around us even in the world. We understand the news better. We understand when people are talking to us and they're getting upset about stuff, you know, or they're in the world and they're, they're you know, you understand your, your, your supervisor at work or your subordinates, whoever you're dealing with, because you realize that, you know, they're operating on a certain level. They're operating maybe in this world as non-believers or they're, they're subject to these different influences and stuff, uh, the lies and the deceit that's out there. And all of a sudden, your eyes are opened to things that they weren't open to before. I, uh, <clears throat> I've been getting educated about um, like uh, the vaccines and the shots and a whole bunch of different things. And, and, and that's just one subject. There's so many things out there, even politics. I used to think that there were good guys and bad guys in politics. I've come to realize it's mostly bad guys. <laughs> you know, There's a few safe Christians out there that are trying to do the right thing, but there isn't anybody you know, on either side of the aisle, so to speak, uh, that really has our interests at heart. It seems like everybody's pretty much just finding an office, but your eyes are open to certain things. I don't mean it to be, you know, in entirely negative, but your eyes are open. But then as you continue into what's described in verse 9 as the fear of the Lord, which is clean, then he says, uh, enduring forever. And, uh, and, and what I'm getting at is that once you get saved at conversion and once you be start to, that trek on wisdom in verse 7, and then you start to rejoice and then your eyes are opened, that leads to endurance. And that's one of the things I think that we need a lot in Christianity today is endurance. It's, you know, enduring to the end. As I, as I first got saved, I'll be honest with you, I wasn't really all that aware of a lot of the people around me. When I first got saved, uh, like a, like a two-year-old kid, you know, it was all about me. And I, I, I was glad to be growing in the Lord. I was glad to be saved. Uh, I was glad to be learning about my Bible and, and my Lord and, and growing in my relationship with him. But honestly, I was so self-focused on that for a season. I wasn't looking around that much. I just knew that there were people around me that were saved. I knew people that had been walking with the Lord for a long time. There were other fairly new believers around me and that kind of thing. And, um, and I wasn't really so, like I said, aware of what was going on around me. But after a little while, uh, I began to look around more. And uh, I realized that there was people I can have fellowship with. 
There's some that I can't. There's these old saints that have been around forever. There's some fairly new guys uh, like myself and all that. But at, over time, as, uh, as the Lord has you know, given me the, uh, the mindset of, uh, of, of ministry, you begin to look around and you realize, I look back to when I first got saved and how many of those other younger believers are still around. And it's, it's kind of hard. The guy that actually was instrumental in leading me to the Lord uh, fell away from the Lord about five years after I, I came to know the Lord. And that was one of those things that kind of scared me a little bit. I, I watched this guy that was uh, influential in my life. You know, all of a sudden, he kind of fell away from the Lord to get off in some weird doctrine and stuff, and then just off he went. And it's like, wow. It's kind of like when my mom passed away when uh, uh, she passed away when she was 36. I was, uh, I was uh, 18 years old at the time. And uh, it was a bummer when it happened. But I remember when I started turning like 35, you know, 32, 33, I was approaching her age when she passed away. And I'm thinking, well, I live past my mom's age. It's just a weird thing. And, I, and, and I've thought about, about different people I've met in the Lord over the years because it doesn't seem like as many people at times endure to the end. They get sidetracked, you know, through different things. And, uh, and what I see here is the need for endurance is really big right now. Uh, we're going to be challenged in our faith. Well, I think I've harped on this a little bit over the last six months or a year, that there's going to be a lot of challenges. There are a lot of challenges to our faith right now. And, and whether it's, uh, you know, pressure from the workplace, uh, you know, to get vaccinated or not, uh, the, the animosity towards Christianity in general, you know, the, the attempt possibly, they're talking about like another shutdown now and, you know, will they shut the churches down? We don't know what they're trying to do. But there seems like there's just a lot of, pressure against us as Christians in general, and we need to endure because Jesus tells us in the book of Revelation and also in, in, in Matthew's gospel, blessed are those who basically who endure to the end. It, it isn't that you ran, ran half the race. You don't get a reward for running half the race. <laughs> and so we need to be kind of focused on longevity, if you will, you know, being a, like a long distance runner. And what I, what I saw in this, and it just kind of blessed me, was the progression in the maturity of the believer as they started off. Again, um, the law of the Lord is perfect, and so it ends up converting their soul. And the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And so you, you, you go from conversion to, to wisdom and then to rejoicing. And, and, I, and I think these are things, by the way, you don't like check off one box, move forward, and leave the other thing behind. I think it's supposed to be kind of cumulative as you move along. In other words, you're, you're glad to be saved, you're converted, you don't stop being converted, but then you gain wisdom, and then you gain uh, the rejoicing heart, and then your eyes are opened and, um, and enlightened, if you will, and then basically you, 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 you settle into that endurance. When I was uh, running cross country uh, about 120 pounds ago, um, I remember starting off in my training, we, we'd run five miles a day, we'd run 10 miles a day, and we'd practice like that just to run a two-mile race. But as you got into the race, there was that, always that initial, when you, when you get started, there's that, uh, the adrenaline, there's the guys all around you, all that kind of stuff. And so you tend to want to run to the head of the pack, you know, and get out there somewhere. And then, uh, but you can use a lot of energy to do that because everybody else is thinking, I don't want to let so-and-so pass me, you know. And so you got all these guys that don't want to be passed. They want to get it in the front third of the pack at, at the minimum. So it quickens the pace of the race. And, uh, but at some point in that race, you kind of settle into your race pace. You, you settle into your stride. And, and that's kind of what you maintain through the majority of the race. And then when you get to the very end, uh, you, you kick it in, so to speak. And, and basically that was, you, you go from your, your settled into race pace, what's been working for you for the last, you know, 20 minutes you've been running the race or whatever. And, and now you get into the point where uh, it's that final 100 yards, 200 yards, 400 yards, quarter mile, and uh, you kick it in. And basically, whatever you've got left, you throw it in the bucket, man. And, uh, and whatever's left, you just run as hard as you can. And then somehow or another, you end up across the finish line with your, with your lungs about to explode, but you, you've, you've, you've done as good as you could. And I think in Christianity, for the most part, a lot of Christians start off out of the, from the, from when the gun goes off, it, it's a sprint. And they sprint, 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 and pretty quick they poop out because it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a 100-yard dash. And even in a two-mile race, there's got to be kind of like that strategy. And, um, 
and, uh, and so as Christians, we do kind of settle into a pace, I think. We're always going to be challenged. There's going to be obstacles and things to kind of get through and get over. But when it gets closer to the end, and we don't necessarily know exactly when the end is, is the hard part. It's just all I know is that, you know, as I'm getting older, I don't want to slack off on my faith. I don't want to, you know, have the, you know, we were talking about retirement and whether you need a wristwatch or not uh, earlier. And uh, you know, cause it's daytime or nighttime, right? But, uh, but as, as it gets closer, as we get older, I, I think that we sometimes take the, the, the attitude of, well, kind of like a retirement mentality. And in the Lord, there's no such thing as retirement. You know, in the Lord, we run hard and strong to the end, I pray. And so I, I just saw this progression in the maturity of a Christian, and I began to apply that to my life, but I also began to apply it to the, the circumstances that we live in presently. And, and that is literally that uh, the end is near, that I, I believe the Lord's going to be calling for us any time, and, uh, and we've got to be strong and ready. And so uh, he goes on to say in verse 10, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, and sweeter also than honey uh, in the honeycomb. And so it's not just that... Uh, you're to be content with these things, but they're to be desired even more than these other things in life that are sweet. And so uh, more to be desired are they than gold, so it's, it's pursue after that. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. So there's the warning on one side, you know, be careful. But then there's also the other aspect of that, the, the flip side of the coin, is that there's great reward. And what is that great reward? The great reward is Jesus. The great reward is being with him forever in heaven. And then he says in verse 12, who can understand his errors? You know, cleanse me from secret faults. You know, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. And I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Then the last verse here, verse 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And I, I picture uh, David, you know, sitting there one evening before he goes to sleep or whatever, and just looking up at the stars and kind of pondering what God has done and, and thinking about these things. And, you know, he, he penned these words, and, uh, and I'm sure it was a song, you know, when he did it. And he's saying, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. He's singing the song to the Lord and saying, Lord, I pray that this is pleasing to you, you know. And... Um, and, and relates to God as his uh, strength and his redeemer. And, uh, and again, I, I think about this myself, that as I uh, progress or hopefully mature in my walk, my faith walk with the Lord, that at the end of the day, uh, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to him as well. And so anyway, uh, I was just t totally blessed to have that, that thought process. Again, I'd studied this through many times, but the Lord seems to keep adding to, you know, the way we understand God's word, and he tweaks it that little bit. And um, I pray it ministers to you as well, as you and your own faith walk continue to mature in him, that you go from basically salvation or conversion to wisdom uh, to rejoicing, and then uh, having your eyes opened up and then enduring forever. That's, that's where it ends up for me is, Lord, help me to endure. Help me not to falter. Uh, before the end of the race. I'm going to be at the end of that race, and when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. And so, anyway, uh, I pray that ministers to you. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, Lord. And we ask, Father God, that you would be glorified in the hearts and lives of your, of your children. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you guys. Uh, there's some extra... Uh, grub out there, take it home to your wife, take her a donut, she'll love you forever. <laughs> and uh, take her a donut even if she doesn't, but uh, <laughs> take the food. God bless you guys. And this will be the, um, because of the holidays coming up and stuff, uh, we're not going to meet again for an FMO until uh, January. Really? Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> well, I just watch it every year, how it kind of, you know, people get busy and stuff and it kind of tapers off, so we've just been doing it that way. But uh, the men's study on Tuesday night has been going really well. Uh, we kind of switched formats a little bit where we're still reading through the book, but we're not doing the workbook, and we're doing a verse-by-verse a, a -verse study through uh, First Thessalonians, uh, just kind of applying what we learned from the book 
uh, to that study. And so it's been uh, it's been pretty rich the last uh, few weeks. And so I encourage you guys, if you haven't come to it, to give it a shot and, and uh, see how the Lord might minister to you. Father God, thank you again for uh, your love and your kindness. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to us and help us truly to grow and to draw close to you and to endure to the end. We look forward, Father, to seeing you face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, God bless you guys. We'll see you next time.